Hi, this is Chris Copeland, head hitchhiker over at Hitchhiker's Guide to Humanity and Human for the Alien Crystal. I'm here today with Ronnie. Uh, we are going to be discussing today Western aid in Africa and the effects that that has on um, Africans in, in reality. Um, it's compared to the intentions that it may have, um, what Western aid works, and how people who are just average people uh, in the West, uh, both in America, Europe, Australia, all over the world, uh, can assist uh, Africa and know that their money is going to the people who need it. Um, so again, here with me today is Ronnie. Hi everybody, welcome to this episode of Western Aid to Africa. I hope you've been enjoying the previous ones and I'm looking forward to discussing this one. So Ronnie, uh, today um, I wanted to just kind of start off with uh, the Western view of African aid and there's um, kind of two camps of thought, especially in America, regarding this. Uh, the first side is that um, we need to give as much aid as possible and uh, we need to give that aid freely and um, assist people with, with uh, being able to create uh, uh, an economy that works for them. Um, and then other people also consider this uh, just another form of colonization or that the money is actually not being given to the people who need it. Um, and from my research, I've actually found that both tend to be true. Uh, depends on basically where you're putting your money um, and what uh, organizations you trust. Um, so in regards to that, let me just uh, go ahead and give you my first experience with the idea of African aid. It was with the um, program Save the Children. Back in the early 90s, uh, there were commercials on TV of these um, children that were living in abject par poverty in Africa. Um, they had distended bellies, very uh, thin legs, and um, looked incredibly malnourished. A lot of them had diseases, uh, no access to clean drinking water, no regular access to food. Um, and I was sitting there thinking that even though I was poor in America, I still had food to eat. It may not have been great food, it might have just been ground beef and onions, um, or hot dogs, or mac and cheese, but at least I had something. And we threw away a lot of food too. Every day we threw away food that could have gone to people who needed it. And the program was asking like, uh, spend, you know, less than a cup of coffee a day, or something like that on, um, helping a child in need and so I asked my mother why we weren't doing this when we probably could if we were very careful afford to do that since we wasted food daily and um, she told me that the reason we don't do that is because a lot of these organizations take these, this money and it goes to the the people running the organization it goes into advertising it goes into investors but a very little of it actually goes to the children um, and that's kind of when I first learned, even at that young age, at eight years old, that, you know, what, the things that were being said on television and the, the things that were said by adults weren't always true, including this. Um, so as an adult, I began to look into different ways to give in uh, to charities that I knew were actually doing the work that they were supposed to do. Um, and I found uh, several good ones. Kiva.com is by far my favorite. Um, I was able to donate a small amount of money, uh, and it wasn't even a donation, it was just a loan uh, to this woman, I believe she was in Vietnam, oh, to be able to uh, put a toilet out on her farm. And um, she was able to do that, and she's now started paying the loan back. It's almost completely paid off, so that means that I can turn around and give that same $20 to another person in need. And it wasn't just me giving her $20, it was also people from all over the world shipping in $5, 10 $50 to help her. Um, so I do know that there are forms of aid that do work. Um, what is your experience with uh, Western aid? I know that you've actually been the beneficiary of some of this and you actually work with NGOs. So let's uh, just talk about your experience with that. I have actually received uh, Western aid, let me say, on, an, on a personal level and as an organization, the organization that I work for. There are so many people who say that Western aid is, is making Africa poorer. It's not actually el helping uh, Africa. But I, I tend to think that it's, it's in the way that it is given and it is applied. Uh, there are some instances where uh, Western aid has 
not actually helped Africa because uh, this is a, one of the reasons why, for instance, Kenya is very poor, apart from the development issues and, and such, are the kind of leaders that we have. Sometimes money from, from the West comes into the country uh, to help in developing something or building some infrastructure. But along the line, we hear a lot of corruption cases, the money disappeared somewhere, uh, with the leaders, nothing has been done, nothing, go, nothing goes on. So it, it boils down to at the uh, NGO level or the individual level. That is where I've seen change actually uh, happening with uh, Western aid. So me, me at a personal level, I, uh, my, my education, my, my graduate degree is actually being paid for by a Western, uh, a Western uh, sponsor. Uh, that is uh, paying for my master's degree. So that has actually helped me develop so much. And as an organization, Aquang, an environmental organization whereby we receive a lot of, not actually a lot of, but enough uh, grants from time to time to help local communities, uh, help them also uh, find economic empowerment, uh, build skills in different things, ecotourism, things like that. Just give them skills to make crafts, take them to school, help them stay in school, things like that. So I think at that level, it is actually helping uh, move people from the, the, that poverty, below poverty line to somewhere where they can at least be financially independent themselves. So I think at that level, it is, it is actually helping uh, African uh, people. So then, now that we know that there are definitely some um, Western forms of aid that we could avoid uh, to ensure that we're not uh, contributing to corruption, um, what organizations should we be supporting as Westerners? Um, could you describe some of the good ones that you've come across uh, in your own experiences? Yeah, there are a number of uh, good organizations out here, just as, as much as there are those bad organizations which do not, uh, the, most of the money, they use it on uh, maybe their staff, uh, they use it on allowances and things like that. And, and just plainly just pocketing the money and giving crops to the local people. You just go to, the, you go to, you go to that local community who you used their name, or uh, they, are, they are applied to get the money and you give them a small handout or you just do something for the cameras, then that is what you use to show that uh, at the, I have done uh, something and most of the money is pocketed. That happens a lot. I cannot lie about that. I've, been, I've, I've never worked on, in any private uh, company. I've, all, I've worked in, uh, in an NGO my entire life, uh, my entire like, uh, career. So I have come across uh, some of these kind of uh, things that people do, which is really very, very, very bad. Because uh, I, you, you walk around, with, the way you say that there are some people who are like, extremely malnourished and things like that, you see people are actually like truly in need. And uh, you, as you are, you don't need, even if you don't, you don't pocket that money that is meant for them, you'll still survive. Your family will still be okay. You, you, you're still getting a salary and things like that. These are people who cannot go to school, cannot actually eat, cannot afford to go to school because water, they have to go like so many kilometers. Half, half of their day is spent looking for water. The same water that they come back with is not even clean. They cannot, they, they end up drinking it, getting so many diseases, dying off, things like that. Food is, is, another, is another issue. Food is yeah, like they, they eat once. You can find a, a family which eats once in two days or once in three days. It is that bad. That is why they, are, they, they look so malnourished. That is like actually true. That this, it's not for, for show or something like that. There's a story which broke uh, in Kenya some, I think it was uh, last year, sometime last year. The Turkana region of Kenya, the, the northern side of Kenya is the one which is uh, uh, the part of Kenya which is like extremely hard hit with poverty and hunger and starvation and these malnourished kids that you see all over the internet and in the news and in documentaries. So the, the issue was that such communities, such groups of, uh, of uh, those counties receive the most uh, money from, uh, from the government allocation. Those counties are the ones which receive a lot of money owing to the fact that they're the ones which need the money a lot 
to develop to help their people but still there's nothing that is going on there's no uh, water infrastructure that is being built there's nothing that is going on to help the, help them on the ground so you wonder where does this money go to so you find that this this such uh, county governments have spent so much money hiring people on their staff who are not doing anything they're just sitting there and this money can actually be used to build a, a borehole somewhere that will help people get water. It can be used for some irrig irrigation or some conservation agricultural uh, like projects that can help people get food even if there, there's a lot of drought. It can be used to do something. But you find that there's a lot of corruption uh, that even this such kind of uh, counties are the ones we, which also receive a lot of Western aid uh, from Western countries. So you find that you, when you go out down to the ground, you you look around and there's not actually not a lot happening on the ground. So you are like, what? So most of uh, what I've seen work, most of the organizations that I've seen which are are working are organizations which are led by, or have been started or founded by people who come from those communities who have lived that life, who know what it's like, and they they managed to get out of that poverty, mostly because somebody sponsored their education, they educated now, and they've come back, founded an organization that helps those communities. There's a guy I was with in some conference some time back. Uh, he's called, I've forgotten, his Kurma somebody, who lived in Trukana, or was it in, 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 those, in, those, uh, in one of those counties, he was extremely poor, but he managed to get an education, and he founded an organization to help uh, educate uh, those people, help girls get sanitary towels, just help and help and help. But along the line, it, it was taken over by uh, some Western uh, uh, people saw what he was doing, and so they decided to blow it up and make it bigger. But along the line, it was taken over by those uh, people who have this, this mindset of benefiting from such communities and their plight. So they were bringing in, he, his model was employing, helping those people get education and employing them so that they can also help others and continuing the line like that. But these people were bringing in labor from outside, just hiring people for nothing, uh, putting money into things that were not actually helping. So he had to leave that organization and actually start another one from scratch. And this was, this one had blown up into a big organization, but it was not what he wanted for his people. So he went ahead and started another organization. So I'll I'll get you this name so that when you put when this the names of this organization so that when you put up the the podcast people can see the names of these organizations that I'm talking about. The same to my organization that I work with. My boss was uh, he worked uh, in it's called Eco Finder Kenya. He was uh, he lived in uh, Western Kenya all his life. He was born there and he grew up there along the lake. And he could see what these people were going through and what his people were going through, what he went through growing up. So as soon as he finished his uh, undergraduate studies, he started this organization from a very small, uh, a very, it's not a big organization anyway, but it's just about helping people. He has not blown it up into something where he employs unnecessary uh, people to just come and, and, and eat the money and squander this money. Every grant money that comes into the organization, we don't even get like, we get allowances, we get good salaries. He tells us, you're volunteering for this organization. You are not working here to get, if you're working for me in this NGO, it's about helping these communities, it's about helping these people. So you are a volunteer. Whatever you get is just to help push you through the day and you can, and uh, he, he gives you the freedom to find uh, money to work elsewhere to support yourself as well. But if you want to give, if you want to work in in an NGO, if you want to be a humanitarian, then that is the spirit that you come with here. You don't come with here expecting to be paid so much money that this money ends up not going to the into the local communities. So I think the organizations that actually help people, that actually uh, produce change from Western aid are organizations which have been uh, started by people who have lived this life. That is what I've seen work and work well. This is just my opinion based on what I've seen on the ground. There are, I know there are people who start organizations who have not lived their life, but who have the good heart to actually help uh, and create change. 
All right, thanks, Ronnie. And just a quick clarification: uh, the name of your company uh, that you work for, the NGO, is Echo Finder. Is that correct? Echo Finder, Kenya. Yeah. Echo Finder Kenya. Um, yeah. So Echo Finder Kenya is an NGO, which is um, a great thing to support once you've you know, fully vetted it, like the one you're actually working with. Um, uh, another thing uh, that can be done uh, that I'm highly interested in is social entrepreneurship in Kenya. And Scoth Transcription does that. My, my company, they're a social entrepreneurship, and we provide... Um, uh, we provide equal pay, um, livable wages for transcribers in Kenya. We have about 20 people, maybe more now, working uh, for us. And um, the majority of the wages go to them um, with very little towards company overhead or additional people on the team. Um, so it's it's we've used a method called holacracy to govern that business. And uh, it's really been helpful and um, making sure that we provide equitable pay, um, that we discuss those pay structures with uh, the people on our teams um, and make sure that they are comfortable with them too and that they are fair wages that, that um, will actually provide them with a good quality of life. And uh, the cool thing about that is that through sponsoring uh, these individuals, they've been able to support their families. Um, they've been able to grow their own businesses. Um, some of them have purchased homes since they've been with us. They have uh, um, uh, put their kids into private schools. Um, they're improving their lives greatly um, because of this company. I will never get rich off of this company by any means. Um, in, in fact, it's almost it, it's almost kind of a, a burden to have, but um, I do uh, enjoy the fact that it gives um, additional uh, funding for people um, all over the world. Uh, now, most of our um, transcribers are in uh, Kenya, but we also have some in India and uh, uh, Europe and um, America. So we actually have people on four continents benefiting from this, people who otherwise might not be able to afford to live, especially during coronavirus. Um, so that, regardless of whether I ever get wealthy, um, that's not really the point. The point is that 20 families are now living a quality life. Um, and to me, that's, that's a far more, uh, um, a, f a far greater way of measuring success in life than um, what your pocketbook shows. Um, there are people that disagree, and that's fine. They can disagree, but um, my uh, my thing is, if if you have enough to live on and live comfortably, you have enough to plan for your future when you won't be able to work. Um, beyond that, uh, you can share the rest, and that's. Uh, I wish that CEOs who have bigger corporations would start. Um, believing this way as well and paying their employees well. What I do see a lot of in, C, in, in corporations that do not operate under this model of social entrepreneurship is that uh, the C-suite gets paid um, sometimes as much as a hundred times more than the average employee and that average employee can't uh, afford health care or food or um, you know a quality life. And that's a huge problem um, because then the C-suite will make all these tax-free donations. These are tax write-offs um, that go to these charities that may or may not be helping the people that work for them, uh, may or may not be helping the people in their community, but they're, they're getting tax benefits off of this so they don't have to pay their taxes that would go into social programs that would help people. Um, this is standard trickle-down economics, and we've known for since the 80s that it does not work, um, and that we need a better model of doing things to make sure that everyone has quality of life. Um, now, what do you see as far as social entrepreneurships in uh, Kenya? What, uh, how are those growing? And you, I think you actually know some people that are that are in Scoth Transcription, or have done work for Scoth Transcription. Um, so. Uh, you know what? What is your experience with um, on, social entrepreneurships in Kenya? The social entrepreneurships they 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 are coming up like really a lot of organizations are now into social entrepreneurships. Actually, a lot of uh, Western aid nowadays they also want to support organizations which have like adopted this social entrepreneurship model. 
I have, I know some people who have worked for Scott Transcription and I think they are, that you're really doing a great job. I also agree with you that if you have, uh, if you're getting into something to help people, uh, so that is what you need to do. Uh, help people not get get rich off uh, people off people, but actually help people. Uh, that is a good a good a good motto to have for an organization. If you're getting in it for profit, then well and good. That's not bad, also. But the problem is uh, with uh, Kenyan uh, organizations or with some organizations in Africa is that uh, the people at the top uh, get into this. Uh, some of them to get rich off it and not actually help people on the ground. So social entrepreneurship is something that is, I think is working also for a lot of families in Kenya. For instance, at Ecofinder Kenya, what we do is uh, we have identified, we are environmentalists first. So we have identified areas of environmental entrepreneurship where we help people uh, get these skills and we give them the resources, the money that we get or the aid that we get, we help in training them, giving them the skills, and then we give them the resources to go and start their own businesses. For instance, in solar entrepreneurship, we train them on how to run these small, small businesses. So we set up for them solar kiosks and they, they get employment and they get something to take back home at the end of the day from that. We have trained people in ecotourism, uh, setting up ecotourism ventures, being uh, tour guides, women in tour guiding, things like that, uh, value addition, on agricultural climate smart agricultural products because the area that we work with is a area which has been extremely hit hard with uh, climate change. It's a climate change hotspot. So uh, yeah, so those are the kinds of uh, entrepreneurial uh, things that we help uh, our communities with. The one of the things that I completely advocate against is this handout mentality that you. You, you find that uh, most of the organizations which go and work in, in, the, in these rural communities or the poor communities, they, they go to them and they train them for like uh, two or three days. Because that is what, when they were applying for this uh, aid, that is what they say that they're going to do. I'm going to train uh, these people on this and this. So they go into the communities, train these people and give them maybe $10 to take back home. Every day of the training, you're given $10 or $5 to take back home. And then that, that, that the aid ends there. You've trained them, but you've not given, you know, you've not really helped them because uh, in as much as you've given them the training, then, then what next? They're so poor that they cannot get the resources to do anything else, uh, anything further than this. What Ecofinder Kenya does, we tell, we tell these organizations from the, these community members from the word go, that they only, uh, we will cater for your transport to get to the training center, but we're not going to give you a handout because it will not help you. I will give you $20 today to take back home. You will eat it for two to three days and that will be the end of that. But if you are committed to wanting to change your life, you will come to the trainings. We will train you, we'll give you a skill on how to make crafts from papyrus reeds or from water hyacinth that is available within your community. Then we will give you a stock. We will give you uh, the materials that you need and we will create a market for you. We have a platform called Ecotourism since Ecotours Lake, Vic Ecotours Lake Victoria. We will give, we'll give you a platform, we will market this for you. And we will, uh, and through this, after a year or two down the line, when you have mastered the skill, you will also help other people bring them into the business. So that, those are the kind of things uh, social entrepreneurship ventures that we have going on at Ecofinder Kenya, and it it it's working because we have uh, we have like um, just before immediately before Corona hit, we were funded by a Canadian uh, by the Canadian High Commission uh, for some projects. If you look if you look at Ecofinder's Kenya Facebook page, you'll see a lot of what we were doing, and uh, we we brought in uh, sixty. Uh, people. We trained and gave them resources and they are now, it's only that Corona thing has uh, slowed down tourism issues because most of the social entrepreneurship things that we were doing were on tourism and craft making. So that has slowed down because of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. But 60 people have been trained and they have the resources, they have the platform and they are just uh, kicking off and bettering their skills 
waiting for things to get better. So it's, it's something that is actually improving the lives of people in this rural community. Well, that's amazing. So, and, and that kind of um, brings up a, a story that, that I had um, uh, read about. This was with an organization that provided aid in Ghana, I believe. It was somewhere in Western Africa. I, I think it was Ghana. And um, the, the organization was a church group out of America, and they were sending food, I think um, chicken eggs or something like that, uh, to... Uh, rural places in Ghana Um, and after a few years that uh, church decided to just suddenly shift its fund into a a missionary group and the the people in Ghana lost access to that regular food coming in that they had grown dependent on at that point they they needed that to live Um, and and to me that's an that's an instability in um, aid that needs to be fixed Uh, because it would have been much better, instead of sending eggs uh, that were unfertilized, to send chickens and fertilized eggs so that people could create their own chicken farms there and feed themselves forever. Um, yeah. And, and th- this goes back, this is, this is um, ancient wisdom. We've had this around for thousands of years. Um, there's even a biblical quote about if you give a man a fish, he'll he'll uh, you feed him for the day. But if you teach him to fish, he will feed himself uh, for the rest of his life. And that's the same policy that I think we need to move into. Um, we need to be giving handouts while we give hand ups because if someone is starving, they are not going to be able to make a chicken farm. If uh, they can't get access to clean water, they're not going to be able to make a chicken farm. So there has to be that daily input of basic needs brought in until they are stable on their own. Um, and, and once they are stable on their own, just like with what uh, Echo Finder uh, or Echo Tours, is it Echo Finder or Echo Tours? It's both Echo Tours is an initiative of Echo Finder Kenya. So, yeah, so then um, programs like that really uh, actually go to the heart of the problem and give people the skills they need for one, as well as the resources. Um, and that's that's the, the kind of programs that, that I like to contribute to. Um, there is one other um, uh, program that I have found that uh, I enjoy. Um, it has to do with... Um, providing loans, small loans to people all over the world. It's through a website called kiva.com, that's uh, K-I-V-A.com, and I've I've donated some money through there, not a lot, Um, but it was for a a woman in um, Vietnam, I believe, uh, to be able to put a working toilet out on her farm. And over time, she was able to pay that loan back. I didn't make anything off of it. It was an interest-free loan that I gave. Um, But it provided this person that I don't know around the world with um, equal access to resources that I enjoy every day. I have toilets available for me every day. And this woman did not. So it was, and it wasn't much money that I had to give because people all over the world were giving her small amounts of money. I gave 20 bucks. And other people around the world would give 10 or 5 or 50, whatever they had to spare. And this woman was able to get a toilet put in. Um, We don't have to, to be wealthy as Westerners to be able to aid people. Um in uh, emerging countries. And and that's kind of like the biggest point that I want to get across to the Westerners listening. You do not have to be wealthy to make change in the world. Um, You can give in so many ways, in so many small ways. Uh, The first thing is just educate yourself on on what options you have to give, on what good organizations you could work with. And even if you don't have money, there are programs that will bring you over to Africa and you can help put in the infrastructure and you can help teach and um, uh, provide those skills to people. Um, So there are so many ways to help as Westerners, even if you are not wealthy. And and that's kind of what I want to to just like uh, leave it on as far as my opinion um, on what the West can do. What do you recommend that Westerners do to create equality and to also, because this is our fault, as as the West, as col uh, as colonizers, 
we brought a lot of these problems to Africa. So it, it is our responsibility to help make sure that those problems are repaired, are solved. What can we do as Westerners? I think that uh, the way you said that you do not have to be wealthy to help. You can help even if you're not wealthy. You can, it does not have to be money. You do not have to give uh, money. You can find a community, connect with somebody through that community and train them. You have, you, I, I'm sure that there are so many people who have a lot of skills, who have a lot of uh, education because some of these uh, communities I don't know, are so poor because they do not even have an education. You can teach people something. You do not have, even if you don't have the money, just find a, a small community, a link up with an organization, find a way of delivering your knowledge to that community. Uh, find these organizations that actually help grassroots organizations because that is grassroots or like the rural poor people because that is where the help needs to go not this big corporate sorry to say this but that is my that is that is what i believe this big corporate organizations which most most people in them are into it to make those are the kind of organizations which whereby we don't see what they are actually uh, doing there's some conversation which was had in uh, in western in the the western uh, uh, kenya network in some conference we were in on environmental issues. There's this big organization. I don't think it will be uh, right to mention its name. It's a big organization. It receives a lot of funding from a lot of big uh, uh, NGOs like um, the IUCN and things like that. It has funding like uh, millions every all year round. But if you actually go to the ground, go to where the people are actually suffering and ask them, uh, what has this organization done? You cannot see any physical evidence or physical people that you cannot, there's no measure for success. You cannot see anything that they have actually done. So what I would advise if, is to look for these grassroots organizations, uh, the ones which are in these communities, which are working in these communities, which have people who have lived lives in these communities and contribute uh, something it does not have to be money actually money is uh, if you give if you give an yes money is important because they will need something to get them to sustainability or to get them to the point where they can stand on their own but it is also important to contribute to the knowledge that you have the little skill that you have because that skill even if it is the the scots uh what you're doing at scots transcription if you train somebody on how to transcribe maybe somebody has uh, gone to school up to uh, high school level they can speak good English, they can master uh, how to transcribe. If you teach somebody from that rural community how to transcribe and you get them a laptop and you keep giving them jobs, that person is helped because you've given them the skill and you've given them the resource to, to, to help. I think that is something that, uh, that is one thing that even Western individuals can help towards. That's awesome. Um, and uh, definitely uh, we need to keep in mind as Westerners that we need to heavily vet the the organizations yeah. that we support. Um, so that's just a, a, a really good conversation around um, how Western aid can help Africa if used properly. Um, can, I, mm -hmm. can I add something just a little bit uh, on that? Um, what you've said about vetting uh, these organizations. We have, uh, we've, we've had a very long standing partnership with uh, an organization from Germany. It's called the Brule Project. The owner of that organization is extremely strict on vetting, which is completely understandable and which is the right thing that needs to be done that uh, Western uh, people need to do. You need to vet, like extremely vet the organizations that you're working for. This lady is extremely giving, very generous, but extremely strict on how the, her money is spent. She, she is, uh, she's, I don't think she has ever even come to Kenya to see how her, but she makes sure that this money is actually spent on doing the thing that I want to support. So it's, uh, it, it can be added uh, to just, not just giving the money, but actually making a follow-up and actually vetting and making a follow-up on seeing how your money is helping the people that it's intended to help. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, incredibly important. So uh, you said it was De Brewer organization? Brule. 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 Brule project. I don't know if, how they pronounce it. B 
R-H-U-L, something like that. B-R-H-U-L. All right. Well, I will ask uh, someone who speaks German here what that means, and uh, we will put links to all the organizations that we talked about below uh, in the co uh, in the description. Um, so feel free to check those out and uh, support them. Um, I will also include a link to Scoth transcription. This is not something that you can d donate to, um, I, I, but if you have things that require transcription, then um, we would be happy to assist with that. Um, so yeah, this has been a great conversation today, and um, it's it, one that I hope I can get involved in more and more as I grow in, in my own so social entrepreneurship process. Um, so I really appreciate you coming in, and especially with your, your background of knowledge um, uh, regarding NGOs and Western aid, that's, that's really helpful um, for Westerners to kind of take a look at this. Because I know that a lot of us want to help. We, we would love to help. We just don't know how to do it. And now that we're actually like connecting with people and, and, and doing that one-on-one -on -one, uh, communication around the world, uh, global connection has really made it possible for us to make sure that the money that we are sending goes to something good. Um, so let's just continue to, to support Africa um, in, in ways that we can and uh, make sure that those ways are actually helpful and not just setting them up for continued failure. Or, um, and I know there's not continued failure because there's been so much progress uh, already um, and will continue to be a lot of progress. So um, thank you so much for joining today, Ronnie. Uh, if you guys have any um, of your own organizations, uh, NGOs, charities, what, whatever you've worked for in the past or donated to in the past, please note them in the, the comments. Uh, we would be happy to check those out and uh, possibly promote them and talk about them on the show. Um, thank you for joining me today, Ronnie. Any final words? For the listeners who have uh, helped some of these communities, thank you. Keep helping. They are actually doing some good and helping uh, a lot of people come out of poverty. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Ronnie, and thank you all for listening. Um, next week, we will be coming back with a conversation on what's next week's conversation? Next week's conversation is on uh, Af African languages. African languages. <laughs> why Africa, why some communities have looking, clicking sounds on their languages, tribal patterns, things like that. Oh, that's going to be very interesting. Language is a uh, fascination of mine as an English teacher. So, all right. Uh, so uh, tune in for that next week. And thank you for joining us. Bye, everyone. <laughs>